Hello once again. In a poem by T.S. Eliot, there is the line, In my beginning is my end. Well, I'd like to turn that around for today's lesson and say, In my end is my beginning. Last week, I spoke about the Old Testament character, Nehemiah, about his dedication, his persistence, his faith. And in closing that sermon, I referred to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58, saying that we as Christians should also show faith and perseverance and dedication. I said that 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58 would be a good passage to carry with us as we enter into this new year. And so having ended last week's sermon with this passage, I want to begin this week's sermon with that passage and look more closely at it. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. As Paul comes into what we call the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, he points out three foundation facts regarding the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to various ones. And we'll come to that in just a while. But notice three foundation facts here. Number one, in accordance with the scriptures, Jesus died for our sins. Number two, he was buried and then on the third day he was raised again, again in accordance with the scriptures. Now why did the apostle feel a need to talk about this? Was it just something that popped into his head? No, there was a problem. That some in the church in Corinth had a misconception regarding the idea of resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12 now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? It doesn't say that there were people in the church there who were specifically attacking Christ's resurrection. Rather, there were those who uh, didn't go along with the general idea of resurrection, perhaps not realizing the implications of their views. Well, Paul here deals with this at quite some length. There have been those even in recent times in various churches who have uh, argued that Jesus didn't really raise from the dead and that it's not really necessary for Christians to believe that. Uh, what some suggest is that this is an example of pious hyperbole, pious exaggeration, that uh, it was simply uh, the apostles' way of emphasising the significance of Jesus Christ. But that denies plain biblical teaching. Every way you look at it, the New Testament points to the idea of a literal physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. Indeed, if we go back to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 38, we'll see that Jesus staked his reputation on this. Matthew 12 and verse 38, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So Jesus said this would be the great sign, the great evidence. Now if that's a little too um, figurative for you, you can go over to Matthew 16 verse 21 where Jesus is quite clear. 
From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And he says that elsewhere as well. So he staked his credibility on the fact of his resurrection. And what's more, the apostles all emphasize the fact that Jesus was indeed raised from the dead. Matthew gives an account of it. Although they're not apostles, Mark and Luke give detailed accounts of it. We come over into the book of John, John chapter 20. John was one of the apostles and John in chapter 20 uh, spends much of the chapter pointing out the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead, pointing out evidence for his physical resurrection. And in fact, he sums it all up beginning in John 20 verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. So John affirms it, Matthew affirms it. You can go over a couple of pages to where Peter was preaching in Jerusalem. He says in verse 32, This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. So he affirms Jesus' resurrection. And then you can go to the Apostle Paul over in Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he pr promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus and his apostles all affirmed the idea of resurrection. Now what some people have done is to say, well, he was raised spiritually. It wasn't a physical, literal, bodily resurrection, but it was a spiritual resurrection. Well, that too goes against the Bible facts. Jesus himself, speaking in Matthew 12, as we've just seen, said this would be a sign, this would be an evidence, this would be a proof. Now to be those things, the resurrection had to be visible, something that was seen by others and could be affirmed by others. Uh, you've got accounts in each of the Gospels concerning the resurrection. Let's look at Luke's account in Luke chapter 24, verse 36, where Luke, like the others, points out clearly that we are dealing with a physical resurrection. Luke 24, verse 36, as they, in other words, the disciples, were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieving for joy, they were marvelling. Uh, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Why that touch? Why eating a piece of fish? Because again, it emphasizes that he's physical. Spirits don't eat. The point is Jesus physically arose from the dead. In fact, there's a, there's a little statement over in Acts 2 that is worth keeping in mind. Uh, again, you've got Peter speaking here in Jerusalem, Acts 2 and verse 31. Um, and this is talking about the, the prophecy by David in the Old Testament. He foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And that's a reference to a prophecy in Psalm 16 and verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, to the realm of the dead, 
or let your Holy One see corruption. Jesus would not experience corruption of his body. Why? Because his body would be raised up. The whole emphasis of the New Testament is a physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And you can't spiritualize that or turn it into a metaphor or anything else. That's what the record says to us. So Paul, therefore, makes the point that a denial of resurrection is a denial of Christianity because it's a denial of Christ's resurrection. If Christ is not raised, then there is no salvation. Christ is a myth. Christianity is a myth. Why? Because the preaching over and over again indicates the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus to be the foundation of Christianity. Have a look. We'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, in other words, have died, have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Paul says if there's no resurrection of Christ, then the, the Christian message, the gospel message is a lie. He said we're lying, we're telling falsehoods because we're claiming that God raised him from the dead. And if there is no resurrection, then God did not raise Jesus from the dead. Jesus died and stayed dead. He was no different to anybody else. He was not the Savior. He was not the Lord. So the resurrection of Christ is absolutely fundamental. On that basis, why would some of the Christians in Corinth be denying the idea of resurrection? As I said, they're not specifically denying Christ's resurrection. They're just denying resurrection in general. Well, there's several possibilities here. Uh, there were Jewish Christians. Uh, it may be that some of those had been influenced by a Jewish sect, the Sadducees, because we're told in Matthew 22 and verse 23, that the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. Um, according to uh, an article by Dwayne Warden, uh, the Greeks... Uh, they drew a sharp line between the spirit and the body and their view was that at death the spirit would be released from the physical body and that it was the spirit, not the body, which would be raised to uh, some sort of afterlife. So therefore in the Greek thinking there was no resurrection of the body. A writer named Carl Holliday uh, he had in another couple of possibilities here. One it was the belief that there is no resurrection of the dead, only of the living. Well, Paul deals with that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where he says, all Christ's people will be raised, both the dead and the living, at his coming. Um, Holiday also refers to an idea that there is no future resurrection. Rather, there is the idea that the resurrection is some sort of spiritual uh, experience, if you like, that we go through uh, during our Christian lives here on earth. Second uh, Timothy chapter 2 and verse 18 uh, indicates some sort of belief along those lines. Uh, not that it was a Christian belief, but that some were wrongly teaching that idea. So... There were various possibilities as to why some people in Corinth were denying the general idea of resurrection, but Paul strongly denies uh, that 
line of thinking. He says there was a resurrection and the fact of a resurrection is indicated by Christ's resurrection and Christ's resurrection is evidence that Christ's followers will be raised up. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20 but in fact Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep so he went first he was the first to be raised up uh, for as by a man came death by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die so also in Christ shall all be made alive Christ's resurrection is the basis for all other resurrection the front runner if you like even the, the death burial and resurrection of Christ doesn't just act forward from that time it acts backwards from that time as well all salvation all resurrection to eternal life rests upon what happened to him he was raised from the dead and because he was raised from the dead, then Christians will be raised from the dead too. Uh, all right, well, that's Paul's claim, but where's his evidence? Well, he points to eyewitness evidence. 1 Corinthians 15, verse uh, 3, once again, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, in other words to Peter, and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And that's significant because Paul says all of these witnesses, most of them are still alive even now as, as he's writing this letter. So there were plenty of witnesses that could be sought out and asked as to what they had seen. Verse 7, Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Paul says, There is a whole lot of eyewitnesses who will tell you what they saw themselves. And indeed, Peter points to this uh, also, as we saw in his statement over in Acts chapter 2, and verse 32, this Jesus God raised up and of that we are all eyewitnesses. We are all, um, let me just, we are all witnesses. Paul says that's the evidence. And we rely on that as evidence today as well, eyewitness testimony. Year by year, I have preached lessons about the resurrection, the historical and factual nature of Jesus' resurrection. I, I preached several sermons on this subject last year, and I've done it many other times. I've preached, or rather taught, class series going through the whole idea of the resurrection in some depth, showing the evidence there is to support this. Um, in my files... Uh, I have an essay uh, with this title, Contemporary Scholarship and the Historical Evidence for the Resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was written by William Craig, copyrighted 1998. Craig makes the point that although there was denial of Christ's resurrection uh, up through the uh, first half of the 20th century, he said then the evidence uh, pointed too clearly to the fact that there was a resurrection. In fact, he said in the second half of the 20th century, it was, and I quote here, those who deny the historicity of Christ's resurrection who now seem to be the ones on the defensive, unquote. The, fav the evidence was in favour of the resurrection. In the 1800s and on into the early part of the 1900s, there was a, a wave of liberalism that swept through the religious world, denying miracles, denying the resurrection. But the evidence now is strongly in the other direction. The evidence supports rather than denies the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And the evidence for Christ's resurrection also provides evidence of 
the resurrection of all who faithfully follow Christ. But this is not merely a matter of theological or of academic interest. Evidence of the resurrection also provides motivation because we have the promise, the assurance of resurrection, then we're motivated to follow Nehemiah's example of pers perseverance, of dedication, of faith, just as I pointed out last week. And Paul, coming down to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, talks about three areas in which we are motivated to stay faithful and be dedicated. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Number one there, be steadfast. The English word there translates a Greek word meaning settled, firm, fixed. We stand fast. And then there's another word, immovable, uh, translating a Greek word which has a rather similar meaning. Uh, Thea says, not to be moved from its place unmoved, metaphorically firmly persistent. In other words, we're not diverted, we don't drift off, we stick with it, stick with Christianity. And then a third area here in 1558, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And that word translated abounding uh, comes from a Greek word meaning to superabound, to be in excess of to excel, to be outstanding. In other words, being a Christian isn't a casual thing. We, we strive to excel in every aspect of the Christian work. And as far as Christian work goes, let's keep in mind what it says back in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should work, walk in them. God established us, created us as Christians for good work. We're not Christians to be spectators, couch potatoes. We're Christians to be workers. Um, Leon Barnes sums up the message of 1 Corinthians 15, 58 in this way. We do his work when we imitate the heart and actions of Christ when he was on this earth. Our work will help the hurting, lift the fallen, teach the sinners and rebuke the wayward. It will often lead us to a cross of our own. It will call us to go to great lengths. But what we will do is work to preach the gospel, to reach out to others, to help others, to help fellow Christians, particularly in regard to salvation. The evidence indicates that Jesus was raised from the dead and because Jesus was raised from the dead, we therefore have the assurance that all who are faithful will experience the same. We will experience victory over death just as Jesus did. And with that hope, that assurance, we should be motivated to be firm in the faith, to persevere, to excel in doing the work of the Lord. But we haven't quite finished 1 Corinthians 15, 58 yet. There's a bit more. Paul has already gone into uh, uh, the resurrection of Christ in great length. In, in the latter half of the chapter, he talks uh, in some detail about how we will be transformed in the resurrection. And thus, because of this hope, he, he calls for us to be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. But then he adds another motivation which is not really another, it's just an extension of the motivation which comes from the resurrection. Knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. If you serve the Lord, your efforts are not a waste. They will have an outcome, an eternal outcome. Um, two passages rele relevant to this. One is in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. 
For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Serving the saints there is helping other Christians. It says God is not so unjust as to overlook what you do. He won't forget what you have done. The other passage is in Romans chapter 2 where the Apostle Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, talks about the outcomes of actions in this life, uh, that it will either be for good or it will be for something not very good. Romans chapter 2 and verse 6, He, in other words God, will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory and honour and peace for everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For God shows no partiality, so nationality makes no difference. We're all on the same footing. Now notice what it says here. To those who are faithful to God, who do good, there will be eternal life, verse 7. There will be glory and honour and peace, verse 10. Your labour is not in vain. You know, I've had some jobs over the years where you wonder why you're doing what you're doing. You wonder what the point is of it all. Well, that's not the case with Christianity. Your labour is not in vain in the Lord. It is never a waste of time. It is never futile. So last week we looked at Nehemiah as an example of faith and determination. And the fact is, as Christians, that we too have reason to demonstrate faith and determination. In fact, we have an even greater motivation than what Nehemiah had because we have the assurance of Christ's saving death and of his resurrection. Now Christ, uh, Nehemiah didn't have the details regarding those things. There were prophecies of these things uh, such as in the book of Psalms and in the book of Isaiah but people back then didn't get the full grasp of those prophecies whereas we have the New Testament record which clearly explains these things, provides a clear record of Jesus' resurrection and how that leads to our resurrection, how also that Jesus' death was a sacrificial saving death that saves us from our sins. So Christ died to bring you, bring us, salvation Christ died and was then raised up giving assurance that he had done what he said he would do that he was who he claimed to be how do you feel about that we're not taking a leap in the dark we've got firm testimony backed up by by evidence here Christianity is not a myth it is something factual and rather than growing weaker, the evidence in the last 50 years has grown stronger. How do you feel about that? How are you going to react to that? Well, here's how God wants you to react. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding. In other words, excelling in the work of the Lord knowing that in the Lord your labour, your efforts are not in vain. They will not be a waste of time. Commit yourself. Let your faith grow and commit yourself, working to the best of your ability in the service of God. And if you're not a Christian, then find out the facts. Look at the evidence and see the commitment you need to make. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, for the fact that you communicated this message through your Holy Spirit, that it was recorded, and that we 
have the evidence to show that what we hold now in our hands is what you communicated all those years ago. Your word has not changed, your word has not been corrupted. Your word is preserved for us. And so we can read our Bibles today and we can learn what you have done. We can learn of what you provide for us. We can learn about what you have promised to us. Thank you for that. Lord, help us to take these things seriously, not to be casual about them, not to be dismissive about them, but to look at the evidence and to commit ourselves to become Christians if we have not already done so and to be strong Christians seeking to grow uh, day by day as long as you give us life. But thank you for the hope that you have provided through Jesus' saving death and his resurrection, that through him we have salvation, we have the assurance of eternal life. We are totally dependent upon you and we give all honour to you and all thanks for Jesus and all thanks for your spirit for all that you do and continue to do. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As always, there's more information. If you want to look into these things, you'll have the links showing on the screen. You can get in touch with us at churchofchristbankstown.org. Uh, we're here to help. Whatever information that we can provide, if, you, if you've got questions, we'll certainly do whatever we can to assist you to, to, to find God through Jesus Christ. Take care of yourself in the week ahead. And once again, I hope to be able to see, be with you next week. Bye for now.